So today is traditionally called Spy Wednesday, remembering uh, Judas' betrayal and his meeting there with the chief priests. And he just asks that awful question, what are you prepared to give me if I hand him over to you? What are you prepared to give me if I betray Jesus? What will you give me if I betray Jesus? And this is the, uh, the lie behind every sin that if I disobey God, if I, uh, put, I recognize what the Lord's will is and I ignore that and do something else in order to be happy, successful, whatever it might be, th this is the, the, that, that, fundamental, that fundamental lie, you know, that, that going against God, going against his will will in some way make me happier or make me more complete or will in some way fulfill a part of my heart that God can't or won't. And this is like, it's, it's, it's just the, the, the age old lie, you know? God doesn't want to make us happy. God isn't good. God isn't good. So if he's not good, then you can't trust him to fill your heart. You can't trust him to take care of things. So we have to take care of those things ourselves. So how do we do that? Well, you know, the church has its rules, but I have mine. The church has its, te its teachings, but they were written years ago by philosophers and theologians who knew nothing about the 21st century. So we're living our, our life now uh, with greater freedom, not chained down by the shackles of Catholic guilt. You know, and that's just the, the, the typical kind of idea that's out there. So in order to be free, in order to be happy, you go against God's will. In order to be free or be happy, betray the Lord and it will, it'll make you happy, surely, because you're doing what you want, right? He gets 30 pieces of silver. I mean, that would have been, that'd be a lot of money even, even today. I'm not sure how, what value that would have had back then, but considering what your average person uh, earned in a day, that's probably, it's over a year's wages, I'm sure. You know, so that would have been a, a, a quite, quite a sum, quite a sum. Okay, so you betray Jesus, you get your 30 pieces of silver. And what happens? 30 pieces of silver. Could have been delighted with himself, you know, go off and, buy a little chateau in the south of France or something like that. But what did he do? I mean, he gets this, these 30 pieces of silver and it makes him absolutely miserable. He's so full of guilt and shame and horrified with himself that he ends up ending his own life. So he, 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 he experiences uh, such a profound Guilt, and this isn't a guilt, keep in mind, this isn't a guilt imposed on him by the other apostles. It's not like Peter came to him and said, what have you done? How dare you? How, what were you thinking? So this isn't like, if you will, the church giving out to him. This is within himself. He feels this, he, this guilt. I, I knew Jesus, and I've seen nothing in him but goodness. And now I've, I've given all that away for 30 stupid pieces of silver. And he casts them back to the high priest. He doesn't want them. He doesn't want them anymore because it means nothing. It means nothing to him. He's given away something much bigger. He has betrayed a friend. He's betrayed God. And so whatever, whatever you're paid, whatever you earn, whatever you gain at, that, at the cost of, of your friendship with the Lord, it's, just, it's not worth it. It can't be because our friendship with the Lord is what receiving his mercy is what gets us into heaven for all eternity. But it also blesses us here on earth. And anything, anything you have to give up in order to, to, well, giving up our friendship with the Lord in order to gain anything can never be worth it. So he's incredibly unhappy. It's, it, even yesterday's gospel, just uh, when it speaks about, uh, it's a similar gospel to today, a gospel story of uh, Judas. He's in charge of the common fund and he, he the Lord says, what you are to do, do quickly. And so people thought that he was going out to buy food for the festival or to give something for the poor. But as soon as G G Judas had taken the piece of bread, he went out. And then it says, night had fallen. I don't think that's a reference just to the time of day. I think it's a reference to this, this darkness that overcame Judas. This darkness that overcame his heart. Night had fallen in him. There's no light, there's no hope, and he betrays the good Lord. And 
what's interesting about the, the Last Supper, as we generally imagine it, <clears throat> and as m most artists uh, represent it, <coughs> we, have, we know John was sitting beside Jesus because John was able to recline on Jesus' chest. So he must have been probably at his right, or well, probably at his left. Well, traditionally, uh, uh, John would have been at his left and Peter at his right. So the first in command would have been at the right hand of, of, of Jesus. So generally, it's, it's, it's depicted that way. John here, Peter there. But if we think of yesterday's reading, where the Lord says, one of you will betray me. One of you here at table will betray me. And then Peter signals to John, ask him who it is. Right? Now, would it make sense then for Peter to be sitting here, Jesus in the middle, and John there, and now Peter has to signal to John, ask Jesus who it is. How could he do that without Jesus hearing him? You know what I mean? Like, Jesus is right here, you know? So he's like leaning over going, ask him who it is, you know? Like, Jesus is right there, ask him yourself. You know what I mean? It's, uh, that makes no sense. But then, if John can ask Jesus who it is, and Jesus says, someone who I will give this piece of bread to. So they, they dip in the dish. That means the chances are, it seems, scripturally, that Judas was within arm's length of Jesus. So he's able to dip and give the bread without everybody knowing what was happening. So it could well be that Judas is right beside Jesus. The beloved disciple on one hand and Judas on the other. So what does it say to us? It says like that, that, that Jesus keeps those he loves close. And the, Jesus keeps those who betray him close as well. That right until the end, Jesus showed Judas nothing but love and trust. Right until the end. So, the, the, again, this idea then of, of God being condemning and having favorites, and uh, even, even the expression, the beloved disciple, can cause people a bit, a bit of unease, you know? The beloved disciple, I, I can't remember who, who said it, but I might have been Father Paul, I can't remember. But someone said, you know, whenever we hear the words, the beloved disciple, put in your name. Put in your name there, because you are a beloved disciple. So you, the beloved disciple, can you rest on, on, on the Lord? Absolutely. Can you stay faithful to him at the foot of the cross? We can try. We can try. Will the Lord entrust his mother to us? Yes. Will, will you receive that as an incredible honor? That now our, our, our queen, our mother, is entrusted to us? So we as such have to protect her honor, make her known and loved. Wherever we hear the words, beloved disciple, put in your name. And keep in mind that the Lord doesn't have favorites and that those who stray or those who, who betray, those who fall very short of the mark, the Lord keeps close to his heart. So all that the Lord allows fulfills the scriptures. He knew all this would happen. So we ask the Lord today for that grace to, to, to live this triduum, to live these Easter liturgies in a way that they reveal your love for us. Let's not get caught up in just the externals and, and that, but like all, all that happens now is, is richly symbolic. You know, the, the darkness of the, the, the church on the, the night of the Easter vigil, and then the one single Paschal candle, the one single light entering, and then that light spreading throughout the church or the cathedral. So now the whole church is filled with light, sufficient light to see what's going on just with candlelight, which all began with one flame. This is richly symbolic of Jesus. So what happens on, on, in these liturgies Again, it should remind us over and over again of the infinite love that the Lord has for each one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life.